Who is responsible for the accident? The captain or the pilot? How much will cost the insurance to cover the losses? What was the cause of the black smoke coming from the funnel? Why Dali turned and hit the bridge pillar? All these questions will be covered in this video, and it's not a guess or information taken from the news. My answers will be supported and backed by convention regulations, maritime law, ship handling principles, equipment operation, hydrodynamics, and underwater forces applied to the ship's hull. Hi everyone, if you are new here, my name is Mustafa and I'm a captain on board ships with size similar of Dali. If you haven't seen previous video, which will be linked up there and everywhere else, please do watch that first. That is about the general idea of what happened during that day. Port and ship brief details, the crew members on board Dali, the timeline of events, and I've discussed if this incident could be avoided or not. Since I value your time, everything is timestamped, so you can skip around whatever fact you want to learn about and you don't find yourself obliged to see the whole video. Let's make it clear first. This is my opinion from my experience and knowledge as a captain and does not reflect what happened on board. The investigation is still ongoing and only the report will reveal exactly what happened during that day. Before jumping into the video, do you know that more than 98% who come and watch my videos are not subscribers yet? So please take a moment and do subscribe and hit the bell to grow this channel and to be notified when similar videos are uploaded. Without further ado, who is responsible, the captain or the pilot? A master owes a duty to keep a proper lookout and to take all necessary precautions to avoid a collision. He must ensure that the vessel is traveling at the appropriate speed for the prevailing conditions. The pilotage is designed to ensure the safe navigation of ships through inland waters and near shore waters with high volumes of shipping traffic. The master has to obey the pilot and not interfere with the pilot's activities. So who is responsible for this allegiance? The captain who has the overall command of the ship or the pilot who was in charge of guiding the vessel. So the answer is the captain and only the captain who is responsible for anything happening on board his ship. The marine pilot is considered as an advisor only, even if he gives commands and orders during vessel maneuvering while entering or leaving the ports. If anything happens to the vessel or port infrastructure as per maritime laws, the master will be held responsible, hence if the master sees any unsafe orders or maneuvers from the pilot, he must either abort the operation or continue it by himself if he sees that it is safe to do so. Any pilotage authority is not liable for damage caused by a pilot. This provision is widely drafted to include damage caused by the fault, neglect, want of skill, or wrongful act of pilot. An owner and a master are not exempted from liability for damage caused by a ship because the ship was under the control of pilot. How much does this cost for the insurance? Master of a ship is an employee of the owner of a ship. Accordingly, the owner of a ship is liable for the acts of a master in the course of his employment. For insurance purposes, this means that an owner of a ship is liable for property loss, personal injury, or death resulting from the negligence of a master. The Baltimore incident will result in the largest single marine insurance loss ever. Experts say the damage could cost as much as 3 billion US dollars to insurance companies. Damage to the bridge itself could amount to 1.2 billion dollars. While insurance companies may face fees between 350 and 700 million for wrongful death. So how these amounts are calculated? Let's take only the example of the wrongful deaths. In our case, sadly, six people died in the incident. In 1976, IMO International Maritime Organization adopted the Convention on Limitation of Liability for Maritime Claims, LLMC, which specifies limits for two types of claim, those for loss of life or personal injury and property claims, such as damage to ships, property or harbor works, the key bridge. Before going further, let's define two terms that we need them in our calculations. SDR, Special Drawing Rights, are supplementary foreign exchange reserve assets defined and maintained by IMF, International Monetary Fund. SDRs are units of account for the IMF and not a currency. They represent a claim to currency held by IMF member countries for which they may be exchanged. Anyway, just keep it simple and short. Today's rate, one SDR equal 1.32 US dollar. And the second term is the GT, ship's gross tonnage. It is a number specific for each ship and calculated based on volume for all spaces of the ship and is used to determine things such as ship's mining regulations, safety rules, registration fees, and port dues. So let's begin our calculations. As per the LLMC convention, the limit of liability for claims for loss of life or personal injury 
on ships not exceeding 2,000 gross tonnage is 3 million SDR, equivalent to almost 4 million US dollar. This only for ships with gross tonnage less than 2,000, and Dali's gross tonnage is 91,128. For larger ships, the following additional amounts are used in calculating the limitation amount. 1,200 SDR for each ton from 2,000 to 30,000 tons and gives us 44 million dollars. 906 SDR for each ton from 30,000 to 70,000 tons and gives us 47 million US dollars. 604 SDR for each ton in excess of 70,000 and gives us 16 million US dollars. So the total is 113 million dollars for one death only. For our case, six persons lost their lives. So the maximum amount to be claimed for wrongful death is 679 million US dollars. Ahead of what will be years of legal wrangling, the owner and manager of the world's most discussed ship, Dali, have sought to limit potential payouts from the Baltimore Bridge Allegiation. Singapore-based Grace Ocean and Ship Manager Synergy Marine filed a limitation of liability court petition seeking to cap the liability to just 43.6 million. The petition claims that the vessel itself is valued at 90 million and that is owed more than 1 million in income from freight. The estimate also detects two major expenses, at least 28 million in repair costs and at least 19 million in salvage costs. That is emergency power, and this is what you see here, and it was twice. Let's talk about the regulation that governs this. The SOLAS Convention, Safety of Life at Sea, is generally regarded as the most important of all international treaties concerning the safety of merchant ships. The first version was adopted in 1914 in response to the Titanic disaster. The main objective of the convention is to specify minimum standards for the construction, equipment, and operation of ships compatible with their safety. SOAS applies to cargo ships of 500 gross tonnage or over and passenger ships on international voyages. The image is naturally is covered in Chapter 2.1 Construction and Structure, Part B Electrical Installations, Regulation 43 Emergency Source of Electrical Power in Cargo Ships. In case of the failure of the main power generation system on the ship, an emergency power system or standby system is also present. The emergency power supply ensures that the essential machinery and system continues to operate the ship. As well as the emergency generator of the ship should satisfy a couple of conditions, such as there should be at least two means of start, mostly battery start and hydraulic start, there should be a separate fuel oil tank, the image generator should be able to supply power up to 18 hours in case of cargo ship and up to 36 hours in case of passenger ship and other conditions. But the important one for our video that it should come a load automatically within 45 seconds of the power failure. Come a load and not it should start. What I mean by that, within 45 seconds it should start, then connect to the main power system and supply electricity to specific equipment. We'll discuss them in a second. Before that, let's go back to the Allegiant video and initiate a timer to see if it was started within 45 seconds or not. So almost 60 seconds, and this to clarify as well that the fumes from the funnel were not from the emergency generator, but from the propulsion, because at that time the emergency generator was running and there was no black smoke. The emergency generator is tested every week. If the ship is going to the USA, Baltimore, then it is mandatory to carry out the onload testing of the emergency generator 40 hours prior reaching the port. The emergency generator does not supply all the equipment. Following are the machineries or service to which the power is supplied from this generator. Navigational lights, emergency lighting, this is what we've seen when the power came back, navigational equipment, emergency fire pump, some equipment in the engine room, and the emergency steering gear. So when the lights came back, they had the steering gear as well. They could steer the vessel and guide her to pass under the bridge, because she was doing 8 knots at that moment and there was no need to reverse the engine. We'll discuss this later in the video. By the way, do you know that in YouTube, liking the video by hitting the thumbs up button helps the algorithm to grab the channel? Just an information for you in case you don't know. Now, let's jump to the theories why Dali turned to hit the bridge pillar.
Theory number one, turning due to wind or a current. During that day, there was a light wind around five to seven knots direction southeast, and the vessel was doing one for one when transiting through the channel, which means the wind direction was opposite to the ship's course, and this will slow down the vessel and does not turn or swing her to starboard. So turning due to the wind is excluded. And for the current, in areas where there is a strong tight current, usually the vessels are berthed and cast off during the slack water or slack tide, which is the period at the turn of the tide when there is little or no horizontal motion of tidal water, i.e. no current, and the vessel left the port during that time. So again, swinging to starboard due to the current is excluded. Theory number two, rudder locked due to power loss. Some theories are out there about the rudder being stuck to starboard side or right side after the blackout which led to the ship turning to starboard side, and this is not true. When we have blackout, there is no power supply to the steering gear motors which pump the hydraulic oil to turn the rudder. With that said, there is no oil pressure to keep the rudder at an angle and it will be free in midship. To have a clear idea, let's see a portion from my video where I explain how the steering gear works. Check out the entire video, the link will be somewhere here and in the description. So, this wheel in front of me can turn this big ship to the right or to the left. But how this soft wheel that I can turn only by one finger to the right or to the left can turn the big ships in the maritime industry? So the electric motors pressurize these hydraulic chambers and this hydraulic chamber push this ram. As you can see here, the ram is pushed either from the other chamber or from this chamber. And this ram is connected to this cylinder and this cylinder is in between this pillar, which is in fork shape. So this pillar actually turns the stock of the rudder. So this is the stock of the rudder and is going all the way down to the rudder beneath this area. So this theory is excluded as well. Theory number three, dropping the anchor turned the vessel. Actually, the port anchor was dropped to stop the swing to starboard side, which was already initiated beforehand and the vessel was turning to starboard. So this theory is excluded as well. Theory number four, turning due to bank effect. Let's define the bank effect first. The vessel here was sailing in dredged channel, which means a channel with more depths, around 25 meters to allow big vessels like Dali enter the port safely without touching the bottom. That being said, the side of the channel called banks have less depth around 5 to 6 meters. The bank effect, and also called channel effect, bank section, bank section, stern section, is the tendency of the stern of the ship to swing toward the near bank when operating in river or constricted waterway. The asymmetric flow around the ship induced by the vicinity of banks cause pressure differences between port and starboard side, and this is Bernoulli's principle. As a result, a lateral force will act on the ship, mostly directed towards the closest bank, as well as rowing moment pushing her bow towards the center of the waterway. This phenomenon depends on many parameters such as bank shape, water depth, ship bank distance, ship properties, ship speed, and propeller action. So this theory may and may not be considered. It may be considered assuming the vessel was correcting the bank effect with the rudder before the blackout and once the power was lost, she started swinging to starboard side due to this effect. However, this may not be the case because the bank effect acts on the vessel gradually and not a sudden swing as we can see in the video. So in my opinion, this theory is crude as well. And this brings us to the last theory. Theory number five turning due to engine reversal. Over time, various propeller designs have been conceived to meet different performance specifications and operational conditions. These designs have been guided by factors like engine power, size of the ship, speed requirements, and the specific mission of the ship. That is proved by a single low-speed, two-stroke crosshead diesel engine coupled to a fixed right-handed pitch propeller. This is a bit technical, just ignore it, and keep in mind and this is important to understand the theory behind the sudden swing or turn to starboard, which I see the most reasonable, and again, this is only my assumption based on my experience and knowledge as a captain. A propeller is called right-handed if it rotates clockwise when the engine is turning ahead when viewed from the stern, and it turns anti-clockwise when the engine is reversed to stern. Hydrodynamics play a significant role in shaping the efficiency of ship propellers. The interaction between the propeller blades and water creates complex hydrodynamic phenomena dictating a propeller's performance. Here I will not talk about how the propeller pushes the vessel, but 
I will focus on the side effect which caused the ship to turn starboard side or port side. So when the propeller is turning, the blades are encountered with a counter pressure from the seawater. As we go more in depth, the counter pressure increases. Hence, the pressure applied on the upper side is less than the pressure applied in the lower side of the propeller, resulting on a force exerted at the center of the propeller which pushes the stern either to starboard side when going ahead so the vessel will turn to port side and vice versa. When reversing the engine, it pushes the stern to port side resulting in the ship turning to starboard side. And this brings us to our case. When the vessel moves ahead, this side effect is corrected by the rudder, whereas when reversing the engine, the rudder is no longer effective and you cannot control the swing unless you use either the bow thruster, which is not effective for speed of more than 5 knots and Dali was doing 8 knots, or use the pull push of a tack boat, which was not available. So this, in my humble opinion, the most logic theory that at that moment, when the black fumes started coming out, the propulsion was back in service and the engine was used to full stern to stop the vessel which led the swing to the starboard side and hit to the bridge pillar. Then the second blackout happened. Please let me know in the comment section below what are your thoughts about these four facts and what do you want to know more about the Allegiant. I will be more than happy to read and reply each one of them. You might check out this video here about the accident or watch the full video here about the vessel steering gear that we've seen a portion from it. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.